Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety. Without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of the mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, Ms. Makita Scott. Present. Dr. Aaron Hager. Dr. Hager, I know she's here. Um, Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Ms. Mack? Present. Thank you. And Ms. Armstrong, could you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Yes, Dr. Mary Boswell McComas? Present. Dr. Candace Logan Washington? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also, are there any other staff members or any other members participating on the call that um, I've not named? Heather Lagerman. Barbara Burnop. Michelle Stansberry. Terry Smith. Karen Levenstein. Charles Patillo. Melissa right. Wisted. Julia Gross. Thank you for that. Are there any board members on? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. So the uh, first item on the agenda is um, new business and we will now have a presentation on the community eligibility program also known as a CEP overview. Yeah, so I know we have um, some guest speakers um, and I don't know um, Dr. Logan Washington, do we have any of the general overview slides still of CEP? Um, I know um, Mr. Wilson was going to present, um, and I know Ms. Gross, they have information to present to um, the committee around CEP. Okay, thank you. And I'm not sure if I see Mr. Wilson as of yet, but I know Ms. Gross is here. Okay, thank you. Okay, is Ms. Gross prepared to present? Uh, I am prepared to present. Um, so I know Michael J is um, joining the call as we speak. Um, he was prepared to speak on community eligibility. Um, and then I will uh, cover a little bit about pandemic EBT and how it relates to community eligibility. Um, so if, if we don't mind going a little bit out of order, I can talk about um, pandemic EBT right now. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background on pandemic EBT. Um, so we know this is a new program that was created to uh, um, 
kind of mitigate some of the effects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It was authorized through the Families First Coronavirus, Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and so this provides nutrition resources to families who lost access to free and reduced price meals at school. And so when schools closed during the pandemic, um, families lost access to these meals and um, pandemic EBT provides them with funding through EBT cards. And this goes to families not only who were eligible for free and reduced price meals through farms applications or free and reduced price meal applications, but it also covers families who receive free meals through programs like community eligibility where schools provide free meals to all of their students. And so eligible families received EBT cards um, with the value of a free um, and families that were already receiving SNAP on existing EBT cards received funding on their existing SNAP EBT cards. Um, so in terms of the timeline, PEBT was authorized in March through September 30th of 2020. And this is important because we've been hearing a lot when benefits were distributed and who received what benefits and when. Um, so USDA began accepting plans from states in March. Maryland's plan was approved at the end of April and benefits were distributed in June through July to cover the months of March through June when schools were closed. The amount was approximately $370 per child or broken down about $5.70 per school day that was missed per child. And so MSDE and DHS partnered to make sure that that data match allowed for as many eligible children to receive this benefit as possible. Um, unfortunately, we know this wasn't a perfect distribution, and so we had a lot of families that were missed, majority, um, which the majority of them were missed because of outdated addresses and some other uh, data mismatch in the system. And so both departments worked uh, through the summer to make sure that as many families as possible received these benefits automatically. Um, in early September, Maryland submitted an amendment to that plan and requested an extension of those benefits into the new school year. Um, and so that was approved through the end of September. And that is an important date to remember because we know that's the end of the federal fiscal year. So this was the initial plan, the initial pandemic EBT plan that was um, an extension of the, the spring benefits. Um, so benefits were distributed again at the end of September to cover school days that were missed just in that month, just in the month of September. Um, so because this was a quick turnaround, uh, DHS or the Department of Human Services was able to distribute benefits rather quickly to households that were already deemed eligible in the spring and had already received those benefits in the springtime, newly el eligible households were then brought in through later data matches um, and benefits were continued to be distributed through the end of the, the, um, the calendar year. And so there were families that received benefits in October, November to de and December, but those benefits weren't actually to cover the days that were missed the school days that were missed in those months. Those were benefits that were meant to cover September only. So the continuing resolution that passed in the fall and extended pandemic EBT benefits through June of 2021 included several program changes and required states to submit new plans to USDA. So USDA issued guidance in November of 2020 and began accepting applications, and that's where we are in Maryland now. Um, so Maryland has not had their plan approved for uh, the new version of PEPT, the extension of PEBT. Um, and so we wanted to clarify that no one across the whole state has received pandemic EBT benefits since September. Um, 
And so uh, Maryland is currently waiting for USDA approval um, to distribute benefits for October through January and now October through February. Um, and so that is that's where we are. And we do have some new guidance, um, new executive order that have made really exciting changes to the program um, that allow for some simplifying assumptions regarding school closures. It increases the benefit amount um, by 15%. Um, and so now families will receive $6.82 per child per day, which will be retroactive um, until to September, back to September. Um, it also includes children under the age of six in SNAP households, um, which will be retroactive to October. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview of the program and where we are in Maryland right now. Um, we do know that there are a number of new schools across the state that have become community eligibility schools in this new school year. Um, we have seen a large number, a large increase in SNAP applications um, and SNAP eligibility, SNAP recipients um, since the pandemic. And so community eligibility is a really important program um, for students to be able to access school meals. But more importantly, right now, it's a really a critical program that allows every single student in those schools to be able to access pandemic EBT benefits in this current school year. And so we know in Baltimore County, those additional CEP schools are going to mean that every single student in those schools gets pandemic EBT benefits once Maryland's plan is approved for this year. Um, and so I hope that Michael J was able to make it on the call at this point because um, I wanted to, to kick it back to him and hopefully he will be able to explain a little bit more about the importance of pandemic or, um, community eligibility um, and answer any questions that, that you all might have about some next steps that we're hoping to take in terms of advocacy. Thank, Thank you so I much. Know. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> No, you go right ahead, Miss Scott. I'm sorry. I'm just the the teacher in me wants to just you know jump in and help. So you go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just um, overly excited to thank everybody. Who, uh, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Miss Gross, for uh, coming in and, and giving us that that overview. Um, is Mr. Wilson with us? Was he able to get in? Hmm. I don't. Um, Mr. Corns, do you have any uh, recommendation on how um, we can um, help our guest speaker who's trying to get in but having difficulty? We, I, I know one of our um, um, members. Dr. Boswell, um, yes, sir. If um, if you were to offline send me a message with uh, the individual's uh, cell phone, I could call them and try to get some tech support uh, run for them directly and quick. You're muted, Dr. McComas. Yes, thank you. Um, you you found me going. I I I don't have our guest um, their cell phone contact. Uh, is it the with the email work? Julia, my Julia, do you have a cell phone number? I do have the cell phone number. I can put it in the chat if that would be. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was like, please don't read that out loud. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, actually, um, uh, Dr. Hager, if you have it, if you could text it to Mr. Corns, that would also work. I don't yeah. have it. <laughs> Sorry, okay. but it sounds like my Michael J can hear us. We just probably can. Can we hear you, Michael J? I don't. It think looks like he he can hear us. Um, if he can, um, Mr. Wilson, can you? Put your cell phone number in the chat, possibly. I think that might be the best troubleshooting idea. That's a great idea. Parents <laughs> can um, can give them a call and, and and definitely have them on. Okay, that works. Um, um, and I have a question I could ask while we're waiting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Julia, right you, Julia, you mentioned um, that the Maryland plan needed to be approved, and I know it's across the whole state, so not just Baltimore County. 
Um, who is approving this plan and, and kind of how long has it been in the works? And do you have a, an anticipated timeline for when it will be approved? I think you're muted, Ms. Gross. Hello? Julia, if you're talking, we cannot hear you. Oh, I thought it was me. <laughs> no, it was not you. Um, I, I, I've, uh, as many of you, I'm, I'm sure in the same boat, have been on many, many Zoom calls today, and many of them have had issues, I think, from the ice and everything, so. Technology. I know. Okay. Oh, it's a, hmm. Well, um, while we're waiting for her, um, Dr. Hager, um, maybe could you just give, because we got an overview of what CEP is, just a little bit of background um, of, uh, of of what CEP is and, and maybe some of the um, concerns or questions or issues that you've heard. Um, sure. And Michael J is a, a much better person to speak to, to these various programs. Um, but, uh, and I, I didn't prepare my notes with exact dates, but um, a number of years ago, not that many years ago, in the near recent future, um, there was a, a, a act to move forward with creating um, this new program called the Community Eligibility Program. And the idea was that if your um, school or is a, has a high percentage of children who receive free or reduced price meals and actually the the formula that's used is slightly different than, than farms rates, which is what we call free and reduced price meal rates. It's called an ISP. And I know that Michael J was going to talk uh, more about that. And that's, um, and Karen, you, you know more about this than I do. So Karen can certainly jump in as well. But um, the individualized student percentage, is that right, Karen? Yes, uh, Aunt, Dr. Hager, it's a subset of the farms data. It's those youngsters that are directly certified. Um, right. So that becomes the uh, number that we're looking at, and then it's multiplied by a factor of 1.6, and that is what we look at when we're talking about the claiming percentage to um, uh, get reimbursement back from the USDA. And the range oh, right. is it's as low as 40 percent of the ISP, 40 percent of the individual um, directly certified youngsters, families that are uh, receiving SNAP benefits, those that might be homeless, um, uh, those are runaways, the, the different categories uh, mm -hmm. that USDA has established as uh, categorically eligible. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Is that Mr. Wilson? Oh, yay. Yay, we yay. got it. <laughs> <laughs> We're so excited. This is only a you can only imagine how frustrating it is. <laughs> Especially hearing me 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 butcher uh, different definitions, so I'm <laughs> glad you're here, Michael J. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, yes, we want to uh, uh, welcome you, and, and and please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, hold on. I'm going to turn my computer off and get away from all that background noise. Oh. So first of all, I want to thank you for allowing Julia and I to join us. Uh, everybody can hear me, right? Yep. And, um, you know, uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to share with you and to learn from you. Um, I will say that while I think we have a great deal of information, a great deal of knowledge um, from working around the state, um, from working with our partners around the country, um, you know, we know that there are things that are particular to every community across the state, um, which are, are particular and from which we learn, um, and we're glad to learn from those things. Um, I will tell you that I have had the pleasure and the fortune to visit your schools in Baltimore County, to visit your cafeterias. Um, I know what a great job Karen Levenstein and her team do. Karen did not pay me to say that. Um, and I know that you have great expertise and knowledge about your community, and we are glad to learn from that and to share um, about that. And so um, I'm going to talk about 
community eligibility. Uh, and I know that it sounded like you'd already begun um, having a description about that already. Um, but I will start from the beginning from, from my perspective. Um, so I'll begin by talking about farm swarms. In the old days, we use farm forms. And I, and I use that term intentionally um, because farms forms were meant to be able to measure which kids were on free, re free meals, which kids get reduced price meals. Um, farms forms are not as accurate, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and many places still use farms forms, though not exclusively. And part of the change happened uh, in 2010, when the Congress passed and the administration enacted the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010. And I know you're all familiar with this. And this did a lot of great things, both for schools as well as for school meals, you know, changes in school meal programs, more fruits and vegetables, um, you know, increased nutrition standards, um, less sugar, fat, sodium, more lean protein, low fat, more whole grains. And in addition, one of the some of the changes that were made um, had school meal revenues increase across the country for school programs, which is important because your your food nutrition service is funded separately by the work that they do. And it also included community eligibility. And so I want to talk about community eligibility just a little bit because I know you know some about this, but I want to talk about why we describe community eligibility as a 21st century program to be able to address um, food insecurity and, uh, and as a good measure and why we describe farms forms by and large as a 20th century measure. Um, I know that all of us are familiar with farms forms um, and farms forms are filled out by parents and returned, um, but the CEP uses a measures which are much more verifiable. Um, and CEP lets you not only look at the existing um, families and kids in the schools who are participating in SNAP, who are participating in TANF, who may be homeless or migrants or in Head Start or in foster care, but all of those programs are easily verifiable. And so once we get that number and we get to the close to the 40% and then we use the multiplier. I don't wanna get too deep in the weed, but I'm willing to have that conversation if that's, if that's helpful at some point. We get a number that really represents what we think is the student population that's experiencing poverty. That's a more accurate and verifiable um, system than the, than the farms forms. I know that when people fill out farms forms, and when USDA does verification of farms forms, um, there's not 100% verification. Parents put down what they put down. Some of that's accurate, some of that's not. Uh, and I don't wanna go into how USDA does their random verification. I'm sure Karen can give you more information about that, but it's not as accurate as the um, community eligibility provision ISP. And so when we have that ISP, um, school districts make decisions about, about whether they want to participate in community eligibility. And one of the miscommunications, I won't say miscommunications, one of the things that happens when you do federal law and then you translate it to the state, especially for schools, is that so much uh, education policy is determined at the state and local level. And so Maryland was one of those states, not the only state, uh, and all states don't do this, that really key their compensatory education funding on farms rates. And so when you have a financial incentive to continue to have a farms rate, rather than to look at community eligibility, that discourages the use of community eligibility. So we had some school districts which were real innovators and kind of stepped out on faith and used community eligibility. Um, we had Washington County, which did a grouping of schools. We had Howard County, which did a single school. And we had Somerset County, which did it district-wide. And that's important because community eligibility can be done in all of those ways. You can do a single school. 
You can do a grouping of schools and you can do it district wide. And that's what's happened in Maryland over time. But that experience helped us when we went to the legislature to create legislation to try to deal with the anomaly between the requirement for farms forms and farms rates for compensatory education funding and the need to the wish to be able to expand community eligibility. And the short answer of how we did that was we really created a hold harmless provision so that schools that were using community eligibility could use the farm, the more recent farms rate that they had for the compensatory education funding. And that will allow, allow schools to be able to do more and to have more community eligibility. And ever since that legislation passed, 2016, unanimously in the Senate, state Senate, signed by the governor, um, we've had increasing numbers of community eligibility schools all across the state of Maryland. Um, so there are community eligibility schools in Allegheny County, Baltimore City, Dorchester County, Frederick County, Garrett County, Howard County, Kent County, Prince George's County, Washington County, Wacomico County, as well as some non-public schools that are also using community eligibility. Um, I'm going to stipulate, and we can have a conversation about this, that CEP is better than farms. It's more accurate, it has less administrative cost, and it is verifiable. CEP is going to get better. Adding other programs to the base, like Medicaid, will increase participation, and refining the multiplier that they use and determining the ISP may also come into a question when Congress re looks at this in the near future. Farms is not going away, not today, but it is less accurate and it will have less utilization in the future than it does now. Lastly, CEP has been a winner. There are academic studies from across the country and even here in Maryland um, that show increased attendance, increased academic performance, and reduced food insecurity. And when combined with innovative programs like Pandemic EPT, it is less for increased participation of students all across our state. I know Julia and I kind of got out of order here, um, but I know that she talked about Pandemic EBT. And so the one thing I want to re reference regard to CEP and Pandemic EBT is that there are only three ways students in Maryland get Pandemic EBT. Either they're A, they're eligible for free meals, B, they're eligible for reduced price meals, or C, they are students in a CEP school. And so I know personally people who called me and said, hey, why am I getting this PEBT card? I don't, my family doesn't qualify. Well, they got it because they were in a CEP school and those schools are covered. And so we had a broader use of pandemic because of CEP that happened in Maryland, that happened in other states all across the country. And that was a way we can help to address the food insecurity that we knew families were facing in the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna do one more thing and then I'm gonna pause for questions or comments and make sure you're still there because you know I'm, I can't hear <laughs> uh, here on the phone. Um, I know there's been some concern and some questions about the connection between farms and CEP and pandemic EBT. I'm hopeful that some of this has clarified some of that. But if there are further questions, I'm, Julia and I are glad to try to respond to them. Um, I think one of the things that we're concerned about, frankly, I think we're unhappy about, is that there's been no disbursement of pandemic EBT funds since last fall. And I'm not gonna blame anyone for that. I think this is a new program that's administered jointly by MSDE and by the Maryland Department of Human Services. I think that we've had not as good a coordination at the federal level at USDA as we would have liked. And I think that the legislation that changed and expanded PEBT, including Head Start programs and, and younger kids, was a good thing, but it, it made it more complicated for Maryland and other states would have submitted their plans um, before that. Um, but I'm I am hopeful that. You know, every day now we are checking to see when that's going to happen, and we are we are looking forward to people getting 
a lot of funds put on their pandemic EBT cards when this when this plan is finally approved um, because people have been waiting for a long time for that. And with that, I'll stop and respond to questions or comments um, or anything people may want to suggest. Thank you so much for that, um, Mr. Wilson. That was very um, informative. So uh, I guess I, I can start. I, my question is, is um, you said CEP is better than farms and you I just wanted to find uh, to see if I had that accurate one. You said because farms is less accurate, less util and it'll be less utilized in the future. Could you expand upon that a bit? Yeah, so it's less accurate because it's less verifiable. If you put 20 parents in a room and ask them to fill out farms forms, um, people are not necessarily going to give you a completely accurate picture of their financial situation for whatever reason they may have. They may want to make it seem better. They may want to make it seem worse, but it is a self-reporting mechanism as opposed to CEP, which uses existing data. You know, uh, the school system can look at which students are, are, are in SNAP households, which students are in TANF households, and look at the existing data that already the state already has um, for those households, and that has already been verified. You don't, you don't get SNAP just because you want to get SNAP. There is a verification process that happens in order to get that, and for, for all of these programs. I think the homeless population and the migrant populations are a little bit harder because the definitions are tougher and because I don't think we have in any of the school districts in Maryland and you know Baltimore County is, is not different here. We don't have a good calculation of which students are homeless, maybe couch surfing, families that are, don't want to be reported as homeless for a variety of reasons. But I, I think that by and large, the CEP calculation is more verifiable and it's based on existing government data. I'm not saying that farms forms and farms information is going to go away immediately, but when you, you look at the existing data sets from farms or from CEP, one of them clearly has more rigor attached to it. I think the other thing is you really talk to folks at the federal level at who, who look at this data from USDA or, or from the Department of Education, farms data was always meant to be used to see which kids were eligible for reduced price meals and which kids were eligible for free meals. Over the past decades, people have hung their hats on that data for other purposes for which it was never intended. They are using farms data for this purpose or for that purpose. And I think moving forward, institutions, educational institutions, institutions related to education are going to have to find another way to find a measurement because farms is not going to be the only measurement that can be used because it's not going to be used in the same way in the future as it has in the past. It was meant to measure free and reduced meals. It wasn't meant to be a proxy for poverty. And that's what it's become in some cases. And it's not accurate for that purpose. OK, thank you for that. Um, did we have any other questions? Looks like Dr. Hager, you have a question? Yeah, I, I wanted to circle back. Um, I had a question for Julia, um, earlier when she was talking about pandemic EBT, could you clarify um, when you said that it, the plan is waiting to be approved? Could you clarify who is approving this plan um, and whether you think there's a, a, a timeline at all in place where you think that this may, uh, may happen soon? Sure, I can, I can talk on that. So unfortunately, I'm not a part of the uh, the planning process for creating um, this plan and uh, submitting it to the the USDA, um, so I can't give a completely uh, accurate timeline. Um, 
But I can say that we we have gotten updates from our partners at the Department of Human Services. Um, so they are the ones that create this plan uh, in partnership with the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, you know, the two the two departments are collaborating on this to make sure that they are sharing data and uh, creating a plan that makes sense to reach the most eligible children as possible. And so once they have that plan put together based on the guidance given by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they then have to submit that plan to the federal uh, agency, to the, the United States Department of Agriculture. And then that's where the plan has to be approved in order for Maryland to receive those funds and distribute those funds to eligible families. So I know Maryland did submit our plan for um, the 2020-2021 school year right before uh, some more program changes happened. And so they're in the process of revising the plan to make sure that the, the new program changes are incorporated. And it unfortunately does extend the timeline a little bit, um, but they are good program changes. Um, they will end up benefiting um, PEBT recipients in the long run, it increases the uh, the benefit amount that the state is able to distribute. It also uh, includes a plan for the children under six receiving PEBT. So I know that plan is going to be revised and hopefully submitted, resubmitted again within the next week. Um, and because USDA has already seen Maryland's plan and it's just a revision, um, based on some program updates, I, I would think that there would be a pretty quick turnaround on that one. And and then do you anticipate because these these were benefits that were expected to come out in October and November and December that families will receive a, a, a one big um, pandemic EBT uh, payment or will will it kind of be sparsed out like it was originally intended? Yeah, so I would have to check with the DHS on what the, the timeline is on that. I know USDA is recommending that states don't give just one big payment at the beginning. Um, and so I, I had heard earlier on when it was uh, the, the hope was um, that we would have approval by January that it would be October through December in one chunk and then two month increments uh, moving forward. I don't know how that plan has changed now that we are in February um, and benefits weren't distributed last month. Great. Um, I have two other questions, but if I, I can wait if others have questions. Are there any other questions? I don't see any in the chat. Um, so yes, go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, okay, I, I just, well, one's a comment and one's a question. Um, when uh, Michael J was talking about um, how uh, there will be more attention paid to this ISP measure, which is used for CEP and less attention to the farms percentages. And and when he when he spoke of, of the, how, um, how much the program has taken off and how many additional schools in Maryland and school districts are adopting the program. And it's not just in Maryland, it's across, across the country um, that I, I do agree with with him that we'll start to see um, a need for these policy changes at these different um, within these different organizations. You know, when it's one school that's participating, it's different than if there are you know hundreds of schools participating. And so, um, so I, I I agree with Michael J that I, I do anticipate um, less of a reliance on farms uh, moving pretty quickly moving forward. So that's just my own my own comment. Um, and then I had a question for Karen actually, if you're still on. Uh, Karen Levenstein, who I've known for many years and adore. Um, I wanted to, um, to ask Karen if you could talk a little bit about um, your role and your office's role in, um, in helping to uh, kind of translate our children, our students in Baltimore County to you know, all these different organizations uh, to the Maryland Department of Human Services to ensure then that they are enrolled in PBT because I know it was a huge lift for you guys to do this while also sure. trying to be here. Sure. sure. Um, it was, it was um, much easier to um, look at the youngsters from March to June uh, through their enrollment records 
that our uh, staff, our student data staff, um, sent down to Maryland State Department of Education slash DHS. And in turn, existing families, as uh, Michael J mentioned, uh, already receiving SNAP, um, received that extra payment. It was the new families that were on the farms application already receiving uh, free and reduced meals by application, by household application, were also then identified as the students slash families that were eligible for the uh, pandemic EBT, and that ran through um, the, the number of days schools were closed, so March to June, and those benefits were distributed through June through July, and any time our office received a call, we would double check to ensure they were in our enrollment file. And I believe Julia mentioned um, things like that families moved or the addresses were wrong, or we probably um, had our, our names spelled wrong, for example, there wasn't a match. So once those got cleared up, it was a three-way, it had to happen at um, the school level or through the enrollment level um, data given to DHS to get those cards out. So that went pretty smoothly. The September benefit was delayed. USDA gave uh, Maryland, asked for a waiver of an extension to give those benefits out later in 2020 and rolled into January of 2021. The, the data that Baltimore County provided to MSD DE and DHS was the September 30th enrollment. So that September 30th enrollment, which is a standard activity that's done by the school system, included the certified 87 schools that MSDE had certified for Baltimore County um, after the um, submission by my office to MSDE for the 87 schools to be CEP eligible. And those families, as Michael J mentioned, did receive the PEBT benefit, many of whom called our office expressing the same concern that they didn't believe they were eligible. Was it fraudulent? Was it, what was it? And so that is where we had to uh, explain that it was the CEP school. So separate from the farms application, although if those families had an application in for September and were processed by our office and they were eligible. They went down in that download um, to MSDE back in September. Now, as you all mentioned, or as we're talking on the call, I do not have any clearer information from MSDE as to when this next round of pandem pandemic EBT cards will go out. That's a true statement. Have not heard from them and perhaps with some um, changes, legislative changes, perhaps that's what they're doing. They're revising that application. But once that happens, our office entirely handles all those calls, fields all those calls, and helps families navigate the very frustrating um, situation that happens when they're not able to um, get through to DHS, get, a, get someone live on the phone, um, all of those things. So we're helping families every which way we can. And as you know, as everybody on the call knows, we are operating the summer food service program, which is free for all since last March, uh, ages two to 18. And um, we will continue to do that under that waiver from USDA through June of 2021. While also feeding kids in school soon, right? <laughs> So absolutely. To add that. absolutely that's exactly. our next challenge <laughs> i'm sure um and one last question for you karen um if a family is not in a cep school yet their circumstances have changed and they feel that they are now eligible for free or reduced price meals and they fill out a form are they still could they still get pandemic ebt at this point or um was there like a deadline for submitting the names to the state Right, good question, Erin. We, as families, uh, look to the application. The applications are still available. They would still be needed if they're um, eligible by household income, by income. So um, again, until MSDE slash DHS um, tells the state school LEAs what um, period of time they're looking at, 
uh, to get those names down to them to make that quote unquote match, that remains a mystery at this point. But um, uh, the CEP schools have been identified, as you all know, and so those schools would probably continue to receive this benefit when, if and when uh, Maryland's plan gets approved and we're able to notify families, whether it be, I understand that families themselves receive an email and telling them that to be on the lookout for um, this uh, envelope that's coming in with a card for the fam for the youngster. The pandemic EBT card is in the child's name. Now, how they're gonna do under age six, that's a good one. Um, and if Julia Gross or anyone, I think again, these are all new um, modifications to the original, which was pre-K through grade 12. Um, students who graduated or left the system were not, they did not receive um, the September benefit. So this is Michael, if I could type in here for a second, or, or I don't want to get in the way of other questions. No, go ahead. So first of all, I want to say, you know, and, and I know we, we use the term hero very loosely right now, but the work that Karen and her team do, and the work that food nutrition folks are doing all over the state and all over the country is heroic. I mean, they are using the Summer Food Service Program to let kids come pick up meals. They are processing forms. They are answering questions. They are doing, you know, lots and lots of work. And at the same time, the revenue that normally would come in to food nutrition offices through a regular system is not there. And so I think one of the things that we're conscious of is that when the Congress decides and the administration decides how do we make sure that we keep, you know, these systems whole, that school systems need to be at the front of the line because they have been feeding kids and they have been providing food to kids, um, you know, and this it's, it, it's not been done in a way that's compensable the way we normally would do things. And so, you know, I, I'm willing to make the case for you, Karen, that we need to make sure we make all of these food nutrition services across the state and across the country whole. That's that's a critical thing that has to have has to happen. And hearing yes. Karen talk about the numbers, I mean, I, I I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but I the number that sticks out in my head is in June of 2020, Maryland had over 844,000 residents who were using the SNAP program. That was the most in the state's history. And so that was reflected in every jurisdiction. And that's because of the pandemic. I, you know, I don't want to minimize that, but we have more families, more individuals, more kids on SNAP than at any time in the history of the state. And while that's come down some, we're still at 790,000 statewide, according to the latest figures. And so I think there, there are a couple of concerns here. One is that we wanna make sure we do all that we can to make sure that the kids who are eligible for these programs, that everybody who's eligible, you know, get signed up. And I know that with local DSS offices not being open um, because of the pandemic, it's harder to get signed up. And so we have a toll-free number. We're, we're triaging calls. We're getting hundreds of calls. We're, we brought on additional staff to be able to do this because we want to make sure that people get access. And so I, I will, we will share with you, um, with the board, with Karen, with others, our toll-free number. We don't, we're not there to answer it. People leave messages. We're downloading messages every day, every evening, just to try to get through and get back to people because we want to make sure that people who are eligible get benefits. Um, and the last thing is, I know, I think the concern from people in the state about not getting pandemic benefits and the reasons why, and it's, it's so complicated. And I know that Karen's getting calls. I know the board's getting calls and we're getting calls. How come we're not getting pandemic EBT benefits? We haven't got them since last fall. Drives people, you know, it makes them not only unhappy, it makes them angry. And I, I, I wish we had a better answer for them than the one that we do. But, but I think one of the things that we've talked about is, you know, writing to the two U.S. senators, Senator Cardin and Senator Van Hollen, to make sure that they know that Maryland needs to get these benefits out so that they can um, 
be direct advocates for the Department of Agriculture to make sure that these things happen as timely as possible. And, and I suggested to U.S. senators for a particular purpose. I don't want to focus just on Representative Ruppersberger or Representative Sarbanes or House members, because this is this is a Maryland problem. This has gone across the entire state. And I really want our senators to focus on helping us get this resolved and, and not House members who think about their locality. I, I won't discourage House members, but I really need we need senators to say, hey, USDA plans been submitted. We need you to make sure it gets approved as expeditiously and as efficiently as possible, because we have tens of thousands of people in our state who are depending on those benefits. And we're willing to work with you folks here at the county or others, but we're we're committed to making sure that we get that advocacy uh, uh, going as soon as possible. All right. Anyone else have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all so much um, for coming here, for for your time, for your expertise, and for for sharing that with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hager, for. Um, helping to facilitate this and Dr. McComas um, and, and all of the hard work um, that went into this so that we can make sure that we have had a robust conversation about um, a community eligibility program. Our questions were answered and um, I'm, I'm very appreciative. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah, so um, at this time with our equity committee, <laughs> we're gonna move on. Um, yeah. And um, uh, and again, I again thank you to our guests for joining us. So we're going to move on next to um, a presentation on the, our equity analysis and um, building on the equity audit that was done because the audit was done first so that we could have an idea of where we are, what our school system has, where what challenges we're facing. Um, of course, the lens of equity has changed since COVID. And that's why um, we need to build on that. So um, with that, um, we can go ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. So we have received a request from Miss um, Mack around a, a, a district-wide analysis looking at different um, factors that go into um, the ways that resources, treatment, support, and access are um, actualize in some of our data. So as we look through the requests, we recognize that all of the pieces that she was requested felt fell really neatly in um, the metrics of the compass. So we organized her request around um, the core compass correlation. So the first being learning accountability, where you see some of the, and I'm going to go through them individually, the second being safe and supportive environment, the third being highly per, high performing workforce in alignment with human capital, the fourth being community engagement and partnerships, and the fifth being operational excellence. So we took a look and organized some of the request under the first arm of the compass, which is learning and accountability and results. And these are the items that we have here. So as we all know, the ransomware attack kind of limits the access to data that we're getting, but we wanted to make sure we were organizing the data as a school system so when that data is um, available, we can report to the board to take a deeper dive into the equity analysis, but also informing the board that we have some operational systems improvement teams that are looking at this data also. So we're walking um, along with you all. So those are the items under learning accountability and results. And then the second is safe and supportive environment. So those are the items there that we will investigate and come back to. And then high performing workforce. And then again, noting the adjacent operational um, systems improvement teams that are looking at these items also alongside with you all. Okay, and I wanted to make sure this is based on, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. No, that's okay. Ahead. No, we just have two, we have two more. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, community engagement and partnerships. And then um, operational excellence. 
So making sure that um, all of the items requested by Ms. Mack were addressed, but in organized within the systems response in response to the, the things that we're looking at through the lens of the compass. And then I know we have a couple things that we were able to put together around just some of the preliminary aggregate questions that um, that were asked district wide. So the first being um, the November count of our students. So those are the counts of our students. And then the number of principals we have and the number of assistant principals. Then also the percentage of students um, enrolled in advanced academics and our GT programs district wide. And these numbers are given um, by race also. So the percentage of our students participating in these programs by race grades four through 12. So we do have that data available. So I just wanted to bring that up on a preliminary basis around your inquiry, Ms. Mack. Thank you. Any questions? I know you were speaking. Um. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I just wanted to first um, uh, thank Ms. Mack for, because I know it is, it is a heavy lift. <laughs> so um, first for looking at the equity audit analysis, doing the analysis of it and then putting together her own spreadsheet and then following up on it so that we're continuing with our mission because it's really easy to get sidetracked. So, you know, these things help to keep us on track with with you know what what we set out to do so um I, I just wanted to make sure i said that so um floor is yours miss matt <laughs> thank you um thank you dr logan washington and whomever else on the call or on the team has helped to start pulling this information together do you plan when you have access to the full data to provide it at a school level um when i put the spreadsheet together I put it together so that it would be very obvious to all of us on the team and anybody in the school system where we have voids. Um, if we, I'll use this example, if we look down, I'll, I'll say reading specialist, and we look down the list of elementary schools and we happen to see a correlation that the school um, with the highest prof reading proficiency happens to be the school that has four reading specialists, but other schools in the elementary cohort only have one, that would be a big eye opener to us as a team about how to address that particular problem. Um, if I know most schools only have one principal, but I know even in my area, there's a disparity among the number of assistant principals at some schools. So will you be providing it at a school level? Yes, it is our intention to provide the um, aggregate data as well as a school by school view. Okay, and I just want to point out under number five where it says total funds per student that AD through AI just represents how that fell on my spreadsheet. It might be something totally different when you do it, but it's the it's special education add ons. It's mm -hmm. our per pupil um, allowance. Um, uh, you know, all the ways that a school gets money. So um, the AD through AI just happens to be how it was on my spreadsheet. But I really, really, I want to appreciate Ms. Scott for following up on this. And I want to appreciate the team for, um, you know, taking this so seriously because I think we need to start talking about specifics um, and looking at our schools specifically to make sure that all schools have the same opportunities to be successful. Sure, and I and think I this want, is a way to do that. Yep, I didn't want to omit it until I asked that question. So thank you for clearing that up for me. Oh yeah, I, uh, yeah, you can take that off and okay. however you calculate it, as long as it includes those budget categories, because I took the funding right out of the budgets. Okay, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Yeah. And so this is a something that we're going to continue to build off of. And then um, I would like to um, and we can probably talk about this later, but both things uh, this as well as um, uh, the CEP presentation to bring to the full board because uh, we're doing such important work, good work here. And I feel that that's something that um, we should share with the full board. So sure. uh, is there any other questions or any other discussion around this? 
And I know um, as we dig through the data, I also want us to take a look at um, the racialized outcomes of students in school environments that are receiving CEP also so that we have a full view of everything that our students have access to. That was one of my follow up items after the CEP conversation. OK, could and you Ms. Scott? Again? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. No, sorry. no, go ahead. Do ask your question and let Dr. Um, Logan Washington respond. Yeah, I just wanted you to say that again. You said the racialized data of students yep. received. Okay. That for schools that are participating in CEP, what you know, who are our students racially when we look at the schools that are participating across the district? So definitely making sure that we add that into, you know, our analysis and the conversation as we look at those equity lens questions. Mm -hmm. OK, yes, we're big fans of intersectional <laughs> information. <Absolutely>. Love it. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Matt. Um, I just wanted to say, so my spreadsheet is just the facts, but one of the things that we, and I'll turn to Dr. McComas for this, we may want to put as far as academic outcomes, I, I don't think I put any academic outcomes. Um, so we might want to look at, for elementary schools per se, uh, third grade reading, um, just have that as a column and we can get that information right from DRAA. And then um, I, I would defer to Dr. McComas and her team on what would be a good indicator to look at for middle school and what would be a good indicator to look um, at for high school so that, again, you know, we're an education system and we are trying to educate kids. So how do all of these factors impact a student's ability to learn? And the way to measure that is to have some type of academic achievement column. Right. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I certainly we I will work with um, Dr. Logan Washington to pull those things together. And I just I ask as we move forward and look at each of these things that we, you know, of course, look at the data, but then use the data to pose the questions to go deeper into the context, right? Because I, what I believe is the, the committee's goal is to generate action that interrupts our data, right, and changes it. So I just want to make sure I'm thinking along the same lines. Right. No, you are. And what, but what if we had a school that by all on paper looks like it should not be successful? It's got the fewest resources. It got the fewest, the smallest amount of money, um, but it's successful to me. Then we look at that school and we say, in spite of all of these challenges, why are you so successful? So I right. think we, we do need to look at it both ways. Yes, I agree and I appreciate that. And um, I'll just say, Miss Matt, you just touched on a, um, a passionate point for me. I, um, not, you probably don't know, but my background uh, with my research and my principalship in Baltimore City was about school turnaround. So it was exactly, I, I did a lot of work around schools that are uh, performing against the odds, if you will. Where are, where are those and what are the um, ingredients, if you will, that help us turn around uh, situations that are not moving in the right direction. So that is for me a very um, personally passionate uh, element of, of our work here. So I just wanted to say thank you for that because you, you pulled on exactly what I care most about, turning a failing situation around to a winning situation for kids. So thank you. And then we would have to have the discussion about the intangible things that we ne can't necessarily measure on a spreadsheet. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That's our equity work. Yep. Good. I'm glad I, this is um, this is uh, really exciting. Um, oh, it looks like we have a question from Miss Pastor. Thank you, Miss Scott. Yes, um, this actually is to you, I believe, and Dr. McComas. Um, since Dr. McComas has just named, that's her area of expert expertise, and I know she will be working with um, Dr. Logan Washington, um, I would like to see that as a comparison. We always talk about when we get programs, how does it look um, in other systems? What did they do? What did they not do? So that we see our own trappings. So as uh, Dr. McComas says, you're working uh, with Dr. Logan Washington, if you can put some of this information in the context of the information that you, the practical 
um, information that you gleaned while doing your report, that would be gr your, your, your dissertation. Um, that would be very helpful to us. And then we have a guidepost when you all bring it back to us and we have some ways of asking what you came up with and looking at it in terms of the data as opposed to us just looking at the results uh, sort of in a vacuum. Sure. Great. OK. Well, that's awesome. So um, it looks like we have some um, things to go forward and we'll build off of that. Uh, it looks like our next discussion item is uh, discussing the creation of an equity advisory group. And that was something that I wanted to, us to discuss because I don't feel that we can operate in a vacuum. I feel that we need to have input. We, we do get a great amount of input, but I wanted to explore and discuss the um, feasibility of establishing an, an advisory committee or yeah, or an advisory group. So um, yes, yeah, so if we could if we could start with that, um, Dr. McComas, what would we need to do to establish um, something like that that would advise the equity committee? Right. So thank you, Ms. Scott. I I just want to share that I also touched with uh, touched base on this with um, Dr. Williams just to really gain guidance for myself as well because I I have not um, started an advisory group for a committee before. Um, what I understood is Dr. Williams was saying that uh, typically we don't have committees have advisory groups. You know how the board has their area advisory groups. So I just wanted to share that up front as we navigate to try to figure out how do we. Um, do what you're seeking to do. Um, and so I think to get started, I would it would be really helpful if we could spend a little time talking about what is the vision around what this group would do. I know you know, like the frequency. I know you and I sort of talked about what you know a little bit of frequency and is their role to answer our questions? Is their role to advise us? I think if we sort of define the sort of the mission, and vision of it, it will help us figure out how, what are those action steps to bring it into reality, if that um, makes sense. Yes, actually that does make sense. And I wanted Thank to get you. the committee's input on that. So it looks like we have a, a comment or question from Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, um, so Anna Scott and I have talked about this a few times and um, as many of you know, my my work hat involves a lot of wellness activities around the state, and I chair the state school health council. And then there is the state school health council is legislated um, in Maryland. We have to have one. And then each school each school system has a local school health council, which is also mandatory, and that includes a partnership between the school system and the local health department. Um, and then ideally each school would then have a wellness team, which I know is an initiative that Baltimore County took on a few years ago. And so um, as we were talking, you know, one potential model could follow that, where there is this uh, district level equity council um, that includes Baltimore County staff and potentially other organizations that um, community members, parents, students who kind of help inform some of the work that we're doing at this council level, but also potentially could help, um, you know, guide some of the work that's being done in schools, even um, kind of hearing from the community to help inform the broader equity initiatives in the um, in the school system. And so that was just kind of um, one model that's been in place for over 50 years, but it seems to be, uh, you know, uh, this seems to work. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on something like that. Could, would would you share with us a little bit how the council works? I think it's a it's an intriguing avenue. I think that could really maybe meet ex, you know serve the purpose that we're trying to do here. Um, so I would love to hear more about sort of how is that council work? How often do they meet? How do they identify who participates? I know there are sort of nuts and bolts management kind of questions, but um, just again, my goal is to to serve and support our committee here, and I'm just trying to think think of all the details of it. So. Yeah, um, I actually have a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> that I could uh, give Wonderful. you in your spare time. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> that <I know. laughs> in my back pocket. Um, no, I, uh, I talk a lot about kind of the structure and function of these different councils. 
um, and a lot of my research and studying the effectiveness of wellness teams in schools. Um, but as far as the local school health councils go, um, what I always say is no two are the same. And so they, 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 you know, every school system has its own needs. And so they function somewhat differently. Some are incredibly large, you know, 50 people and they have subcommittees and they're incredibly um, active and big. And then some are just a few people who really kind of help the uh, operations of wellness within the school system move forward. Um, in Baltimore County, um, it's uh, co-chaired by uh, Deb, Deb Somerville, who's the, the school nurse, so she could certainly let you know more about that. And then a, a community member is, is the other co-chair, which is also a, a nice way to set it up to have someone from the community and someone from the school system co-chair a committee like this. Um, and then some, some of these uh, councils will provide guidance um, for policy. So they, maybe they would review policies, they would help um, inform policies at the kind of system level, and then some of them work to support school level functions. So kind of look downwards and then some look both ways. And so they, they can really function in lots of different ways and they can be set up how, however you want them to be. Um, and then some of the best practices for ensuring progress and effectiveness really are um, having then those councils report out to the board what they've accomplished this year um, and have some some sort of uh, accountability structure in place so that their goals are met each year. But I can I can literally talk about this for an hour. So <laughs> if you ever want me to, um, I'm happy to. This is very helpful. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Hagar. This is very helpful. And I didn't mean to cut you off if you had other information to share. No, I, I, I will say that um, it's easier to start with a local local council, you know, at the at the system level, and then you know, and I know that um, we had heard from uh, Dr. Lisa Williams that there was an initiative to kind of have an equity liaison within each school, and so if that is something that we are working towards achieving, or maybe have already achieved, then it seems to me that a system level council that that could be there to support those individuals and all you know all the schools would would be something that could be, be helpful. Yes, so we have a equity liaison for each of our school for already assigned for each of our schools. It's been um, a system that's been in place for probably over 10 years or so. Um, so we do have those individuals in place and they um, run the gamut from instructional staff to to even um, our AAA, double A staff. So they are staff members. Okay. It looks like we had a question from Ms. Mack. I'm not sure it's a question um, and I haven't thoroughly thought this through, but is it possible that we could utilize membership from our existing approved advisory committees? Like, could we create a committee where we had one member from each one of our area advisory committees, um, somebody from the GTCAC, somebody from the CCAC, um, because, you know, our area advisory committees represent the unique needs of our areas. The GTCAC um, represents a group of students, just like the CCAC represents a, a group of students. And and maybe even, ex, you know, I'm thinking about having principal, teacher, and student representation, but we don't want it to be too unwieldy. But I, I do think utilizing our existing advisory committees as to pull them in as needed would give us a, a more wide um, understanding of some of the challenges they face. Like I attend their meetings. I attend the GTCAC and the CCAC and they bring up the challenges that the students they represent face. And I think we should, as an equity committee, um, utilize that. If I may, okay. Ms. Mack, I'd just like to um, chime in. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, I didn't mean to Oh no, no, there. go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, in fact, when I was discussing with Dr. Williams how to move forward with a request around forming an advisory group, that's when um, in our discussion and is when he said, you know, really, we want to consider using those area advisories. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say that a, little, a few minutes ago. Oh, okay. um, just when I was sharing, like I was exploring like, OK, how, what, do, what do I do to help support this request? Um, he had that same recommendation, so I just wanted to uh, make sure I didn't forget adding his his um, you know, his thought partnership with this. Okay, and that's all I have to add, Miss Scott. Again, I haven't thought it through, but that's what jumps out at me. Okay, 
Thank you for that. Looks like we, uh, Ms. Pestor has a question. Yes, this is um, to Dr. Logan Washington about um, the schools having their um, equity liaison. Do you meet or the department, does your department meet with them? Um, how do you engage them? And let me just tell you, so I, uh, I'm not setting you up, that at the um, TABCO uh, Black Lives Matters in Schools uh, conference, um, in the, I was in the secondary workshop. I'm trying to remember, were you in that workshop, Dr. Logan Washington? Yes. Okay, yes. then yes, you'll that remember that um, a couple of the folks mentioned that, in fact, one that was very engaged, that she didn't know who was on, who that was, and what the committee was, and someone else chimed in, and I believe then there was another one. So one of the things is certainly to activate them, but how do you work, how does the department work with them so that they are actively engaged in their schools, or what is the work of that person? So the work of that person, um, theoretically, they are selected through their school base administrator. So the principal is a principal selection, um, and generally um, teachers and other staff members advocate to to um, be in that position. We, we convene them um, one per school each year at our MCPC conference, which is a two day event where they get you know, access to colleagues and um, trainers and experiences that build their capacity for equity based decision making. We also um, definitely invite them and have over the years invited them to participate in our um, foundational equity work seminar. So generally this person has um, participated in a two day training just like we discussed in January and at least 12 follow up sessions to build their capacity on the school level. And then this year in our in our um, quest to move our work from theory to practice, they are um, encouraged to be an active member on schools instructional leadership teams, as well as to be a pivotal voice in um, the establishment of school based equity teams. So that's generally the experience that they have. We do only have one per school, but that's the convening that we um, try and experiences we offer them throughout the year. Thank you. Um, then what Ms. Scott is asking uh, is, is critical, and I see this committee having one. Other committees might not have such a group, but this one, this committee is is different um, because it's going to touch its tentacles, touch so many areas. So I can see um, the suggestion that both Dr. Williams and Ms. Mack just included about the advisories, the advisory councils, et cetera. But if we're going to make sure that these things are happening in our schools, then we do need those advise or those liaison, um, the li liaison in each school, and they need to be active and the people in the schools need to know who they are. Um, so that means that for this committee, that with the training, those who come, and I'm sure the training is excellent, so those who come are not across the system taking it back and working with uh, the schools, and you're correct, sitting on school improvement and uh, on the leadership team, they should be there because we need those guides inside the school. So, Ms. Scott, I would suggest that coming out of this department that we make sure that that's activated and really working and that our schools are taking it seriously because they are the harbingers, um, they are the messengers of what we're trying to do for all of our children in all of our, our ways. So whatever else we come up with, I'm suggesting Dr. McComas and Dr. Logan Washington that we get those people up and running right now because they're all in place. Thank you, Ms. Pestor. It looks like there's a follow-up question from Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, uh, just again, drawing parallels to the wellness teamwork that um, that I do. 
do these equity liaisons get paid and do they have a uh, deliverable of some sort at the end of the year that they uh, report back on their accomplishments? Currently, the position is not a paid um, EDA um, position, but they do um, generally run um, school-based trainings within their purview and participate in advanced leadership for equity trainings. We are currently in the process of running a teacher equity academy. That's a TOT model. Um, it's a, again, it's in a, its pilot format, and we have about 23 teachers at different um, schools that will, you know, really even be certified to deliver foundational equity training within the schools, but it is not currently an EDA. Yeah, no, I've been fighting for 10 years probably to get a wellness team leaders paid, so I know it's a challenge, and the folks who end up doing it unpaid means usually means they're really dedicated. So yeah, that's a good great thing. Group, but it's great they, group of people. But they, but they deserve they deserve uh, you know payment for their efforts. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Looks like uh, Ms. Pastor, you have a question again. I I do, and it's on this same piece. So I'm just going to request and not just put out there that we get um, from. Um, Dr. Logan Washington and Dr. McComas, however you you choose to do it or adding it to what you're doing with Ms. Mack's questions. But I want to know how many of our schools are actively engaged, their, their liaisons. I just heard you said 23 folks will come and maybe that's how many you wanted or picked. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. And then Dr. Hager just mentioned the EDA and you'll recall um, Dr. Logan Washington, that that question as well came up in mm -hmm. our session. And I made a commitment at that time the, uh, to take a look into that. And I have. Um, and Dr. Um, Ms. Scott and I um, also talked about these things after um, that day. But I would, I, I'm, I, you, we just can't, any of the, all of those things that, that you listed at the beginning, which are excellent. When we get down to it, to making progress, if we mm -hmm. have a person in the school, then that person needs to really be committed. That means the administration needs to be committed to that follow through. So I would like to know how many are throughout the county are really functioning in their role um, because they become the voice. They become one of the links from us, from curriculum, back to their schools. So Absolutely. I'm making that a request, asking that um, to be attached to the work that you're doing uh, um, in tandem with that chart we saw at the beginning, please. Absolutely, that is Thank timely. You. Yep. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, and that, that actually brings into, you know, uh, Ms. Pastor, I, oh, I'm sorry, do, were there any other questions? Um, I just wanted to to say that time brings into, you know, something that we can have at our presentation for our next meeting, um, Mrs. Pastor's request. But on the equity committee advisory um, discussion, I wanted to make sure because I want to know for our next meeting <clears throat> um, information as far as you know establishing an equity council with what we suggest with the area advisory council. Um, including uh, equity liaisons at the school. Um, so, you know, I think we've discussed and we are in favor of setting up something because it's not business as usual. I, I do feel that we do need um, something set up so that we can get information and we can make sure that that we are responsive and that we're hearing from, from everyone in, in regards to equity or inequities. Um, so the we've talked about the feasibility of setting it up, but I would like to know now the next steps to actually set it up and um, what we needed to do to go about doing that. And then also um, perhaps having a, a list presented to us of who would be on that um, council or, or on that committee. And then we could also talk perhaps at our next meeting with the nuts and bolts of when it would meet, how often it would meet. But I think the equity liaisons at each school um, are imperative as well as like Ms. Max said, the area advisory council. Um, all of those things are very important. So what I could do, um, Ms. Scott, is I can work um, with with um, our team here to put together a proposal based on the discussion that we had today and bring that uh, to the committee 
um, next uh, month, and then we can uh, see if that is if it if the proposal based on all the discussion we just had um, suits uh, the the committee's pleasure. And then we can, um, as you said, do the next steps, which would be sort of defining more of the um, sort of frequency and and some of the mechanics of operating that way. Is that would that work? That would work for me. That sounds like a good next step. Um, okay. And I would. Um, I think I would also ask in that do we need to include a health component because of COVID-19 that's changed the lens of equity? So would it be feasible to have like maybe a, a school nurse or someone involved? Um, I just think that with everything going on, you know, I, I, I just will wonder about that. It might not be a school nurse, but someone who could offer a health component to it to advise us. Um, just I, I just wanted to know the feasibility of that. I, I think it's it's we can define this group. Um, we can shape this group how we the committee so chooses. So um, I think you you're hit on a great point because again, if the goal is to be comprehensive and holistic and how we are looking at equity, we don't want to leave something out. So I could certainly reach out to Deb Somerville. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it looks like it's a comment. I have a yeah, oh. I was going to say I have a quick comment really specifically to that in that um, I'm not sure if it's if it's worth having Deb come to our meeting, but potentially Ms. Scott, if, if you even uh, could have a conversation with her because she does chair the school health council. And um, and in, again, in, in my world, I think a lot about health equity and educational equity, and there's clearly a big intersection there as well. Um, okay. So I'm just wondering even if the existing, you know, for decades school health council could, um, could be like a, sister organization you know to the to the equity council with some you know like very uh planned and purposeful overlap it's like a venn diagram of sorts you know so that mm -hmm. we we could kind of um consider it all of it together in a way yeah yep absolutely um miss pastor it looks like you have a comment as well yes along the same lines as we're going through the areas about which we have spoken before um some some way including hr because we talked about staffing in mm -hmm. the schools and outside the schools i don't know if one of them would be a part of this or but there's some something they have to contribute to such a committee uh, uh, because that too impacts how we how successful we become as a system thank you got it okay yeah, no, that sounds good. So these are the building blocks that we'll use to build upon to create this committee. And then, um, then we'll bring our suggestions and information to the full board. So, um, yep. So um, any other questions or discussion on the committee or the advisory group? No? Okay. Um, so I wanted to go... Go ahead, Ms. Scott. I was I was just going to say at the end of the meeting, I was hoping that we could um, just establish the agenda for the next meeting so that the the team and I can get planning on it. So I just wanted to see if that would be possible before we close the meeting. Oh, absolutely. That's what I was going Thank to you. next, Susie. <laughs> uh, any agenda um, items or discussion? Uh, I think we've we've got several. One, um, the committee, and you're going to bring us back a presentation. Well, a uh, a uh, 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 proposal on the committee who would be on it and the next steps with which to get it started. So that's that's something that that's important. So um, that's my request. Um, and then uh, other uh, committee members, what is there any additional requests anyone has? OK, um, another uh, something else I would like to hear about. Excuse me one second. I'm sorry, I couldn't get my um, mute off. I had sent an email and we talked about this earlier um, on on the curriculum committee. Schools are just now analyzing their ready to read um, act screening um, data. And um, I don't know that we need to have it on the next committee, but I do think it is something that we as a committee should should look at. And it is on one of the slides that Dr. Logan Washington presented as information, but I just want to point out that um, I looked at Howard County's data 
And it's very, very troubling. And since we are twice the size of Howard County, I think it's something that we look, have, to, have to look at it as a committee, look at our data and figure out what we're gonna do about it in the near term. Um, and in the back of my mind is, I'm hoping that we have allocated budget dollars correctly for when our these kids who took the, the ready um, to read assessment, do we have the staff available to meet their needs? So again, I don't know that it needs to be the next committee, but I, I'm next meeting, but I do think it is something that we need to keep on our radar. Okay. Yeah, no, that's important. So um, yeah, my, you're right. It, it's something we can keep on our radar and, and that we will discuss and look at. Um, I wanted to ask, because I, I saw uh, it was brought up about the Teacher Equity Academy. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to know if we could discuss and look at training for teachers in regards to equity, but specifically um, COVID-19 specific. If we could hear what training schools, teachers, Somewhere. principals, everyone, um, because uh, it's just things are different than how they were even last year or year before. And um, just hearing COVID specific training that's being offered to all staff as we have our kids coming back into the schools and making sure that everyone is well prepared and, and giving specifics of when it's being offered, um, who it's being offered to, how it's being offered, and some details on, on what that training is. I think that, that would be useful. Okay. Uh, oh, it looks like uh, Dr. Hager, <laughs> you have an idea? <laughs> yeah, so it might, might not be a good one. I just came up with it. Um, I know as kids are returning to uh, school buildings, there have been some um, some stories and you know in the news mostly about um, you know potentially that a disproportionate number of white and wealthy students are returning to school, and we're not necessarily bringing um, kids into the building um, that represent the full spectrum of, of schools. And that's not just for Baltimore County; it's I'm looking at uh, other states. So um, at some point, I'm sure that Baltimore County will um, do that sort of analysis. So um, I was just thinking if it was available by the next meeting, just to describe kind of what, what students opted into hybrid learning and which students didn't um, kind of as a demographic profile. So That's a good idea. Yeah, it, I guess Dr. McCombs, you would let us know if that is, if that data is available, because I know a survey went out um, so if that's something that's available at our next meeting, um, that would be great for the agenda. If not, then the meeting after. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Dr. McComas. <laughs> Thank you, I'm sorry. Um, I will have to look to see how um, DRAA, when they collected that data, to what degree they can disaggregate that. Um, I just, I don't want to over promise and then under deliver. Um, so if you'll just give me an opportunity to research that and then I can email you and let you know if we think that that's uh, a feasible for the next meeting or what meeting maybe it would be. That's fine. It was, yeah, again, just an idea. <laughs> so yeah. Whatever you can yeah, find it's out. It's interesting be because I, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think just the fact that, you know, when you look at the numbers of people who are like, no, I'm going to stay virtual versus the the folks who are like, you know, no, I, I need to get my child in there as soon as I can. And, you know, everyone wants to be back to normal. <laughs> I know I do, um, but it, it is worth looking at because I think we will see some significant uh, interesting patterns there, so. Yeah, and I know my team um, in the Department of Equity, we are, we've been having those conversations and really, you know, trying to invest it investigate the difference the differences make even in options and choices that families have are in that realm with that and in I'm, front of it. Thank you for that, Dr. Logan Washington, because that's what I was going to ask um, to build off of what Dr. Hager said. Uh, for those who aren't returning, you know, and again, this is probably for a future meeting, but why? Some of the reasons mm -hmm. why, like you're showing, which areas, who's returning and then the reasons for not returning, the reasons for returning and, and just sort of, like you said, disaggregating that information. Um, so that we have, so I, I think all of that will help build our council, um, everything. And it, it's really a, um, for us as a committee, a holistic approach. 
So, and, and I would just add um, survey non-response uh, because I know that in the survey you could opt into remaining hybrid, but also if you didn't do the survey, you remain hybrid. And so, um, I I personally have a lot of concerns about not reaching certain families and who then wouldn't have have that option. And so, I think that could be a, an important metric in that as it all gets pulled together. So, great. Hope we didn't overload you, Dr. <laughs> No, I, I just appreciate trying to establish the agenda so that I give the team as much time to, to get the work done. And, and so I tried to put in the chat what I believe right now we definitely have for our topics and then I'll research the, the other question around the demographics and find out is that are we able to, to pull that together uh, in time for the next meeting or not? And then um, would it be OK as well if, if at the next committee um, we we sort of um, pulled together? I know we went over the equity analysis and I just want to I really do great when we can sort of have a roadmap so that we can kind of plan and we can revisit and move things around each um, month as we need to. Would that be OK if we brought forward sort of like uh, April like we'll be in March, so April would be these topics we project. Uh, May would be certain topics. June would be certain topics. Would that be acceptable? That's acceptable to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. And again, we're always flexible. It just sort of helps us line up the um, planning part of making sure that the airtime is well. You know, like we pull together the resources that um, you want. We want to make most use of your time. So perfect. Just one last thing, Ms. Pestor, the question that you had, we are actively working on a survey to um, be able to get you an answer for that. We were, it was in the midst anyway, so uh, we probably will have that sooner than later. I'm not sure if it'll be ready for next month, but definitely by um, April. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. All right. Is there any further business? Okay. All right. I mean, this has been a, a awesome meeting. Um, I've learned so much. I'm looking forward to um, our, our, our next meeting. So um, uh, if there's no further um, business or, or concerns, then um, this meeting is now adjourned. And I thank everyone who's joined us and um, we'll see you all next month. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.